So a very good afternoon, everyone. Today, from uh, on behalf of students and academia of Indian Institute of Technology, Banaras Hindu University, I, Pratyush Singh, Joint Secretary of Astronomic Club IIT BHU, would like to would like to enlighten you that uh, the uh, first and foremost, I want to thank the physics department that they have given us the chance to host the uh, the wonderful session. Today with us, we have our esteemed presence of Dr. Dibankar Banerjee, Director of Aryabhatta Research Institute of Observation Science, who is going to enlighten us on the latest, latest developments in the space fields of space exploration, particularly Aditya Alvan mission. Dr. D Dr. Deepankar Banerjee is rewarded uh, and is renowned astrophysicist who has made significant contributions to the field of solar physics. He had conducted extensive research on sun's atmosphere, magnetic fields, uh, solar storms, and had played an important role in several space projects like Solar Heliospherical Observatory, the High Node spacecraft, and the Aditya Alvan mission. The, advan the advancement of technology has brought about the tremendous changes in our lives. And one of the most exciting aspects is launching the indigenous missions that we are doing today, like Aditya. And these missions are not only the testaments of our technological progress, but also they provide us the uh, platform for cutting edge research in space research. In, it's an amazing to see that India is making significant strides in the field of uh, space exploration and astrophysics and is taking the lead in several areas. The Aditya Alvan mission is one of those prime examples, and indeed an honor that we have an expert with us who will tell us about the missions further. I believe that the future of space missions lies on the collaborative efforts, where the best minds from different fields come together to develop innovative solutions for complex problems. In this regard, I would like to express my hope that the IIT system can contribute in the mission concepts and development in the future projects. With further ado, I would like to invite Professor Deepankar to take the podium and share his valuable insights with us. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to interact with the students at large. Uh, we are uh, having this uh, three-day workshop on uh, Aditya L1 uh, support cell at uh, IIT BHU uh, with our colleagues from physics department. And uh, this public lecture is uh, part of that workshop. And I'm, I'm delighted to see uh, many more students who are not uh, just attending the workshop, but uh, are here today. Um, and as you mentioned in your introductory uh, remarks, that it is uh, so important to have, you know, connect with the, with the students at large from multidisciplinary areas as well. And that includes uh, science and engineering both. And IIT uh, provides a right platform for such, a, you know, a discourse. And I'm really happy that, you know, uh, students or engineering students particularly are probably attending this uh, session. And I'm also very happy that uh, this has been organized by uh, the Astronomy Club. Uh, they are um, very enthusiastic people I know. Sometimes they're much better off uh, in terms of even astronomy or the night sky than me. Uh, I only look at sun, uh, which doesn't appear in the night. So, uh, so I have uh, my own limitations, but the students in Astronomy Club I have experienced, you know, in different IITs and ISAs are really, really brilliant. And I'm really glad that uh, you're also trying to engage yourself with the uh, future missions and the projects and so on. So today I will talk about uh, this uh, title is given to me is the variability, uh, the nearest star, the sun. It does vary of different time scales. So I will talk about it and how our uh, new mission, uh, namely the Aditya is going to help in that endeavor. I will try to highlight before I get into our sun. I will also like to highlight uh, the location where I come from. And you see already some beautiful, pretty pictures. So this is the campus uh, where I live in, um, in Nainital. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to work. Sometimes, you know, we astronomers or astrophysicists, 
are really privileged. Uh, we are paid for our hobbies. Uh, so that's what we say, uh, which allows us to uh, you know, move around in the globe. Uh, we still have not gone to space, but uh, our instruments have gone to space. Um, and uh, you know, we really enjoy what we do. And I think you know, I wanted to just share that uh, excitement what we have in our daily life. Uh, we don't work nine to five, we work 24 by seven, 365 because our ideas can come suddenly at the middle of the night and we feel excited to implement it. And, uh, and at this stage of life, I think if any idea comes, I don't know how to implement it as my students do and my younger colleagues do. So uh, that way, you know, the next generation will really pave the way, uh, you know, for our next thing. So that's our campus in Nainital. Uh, but more recently, we have a new campus at Devasal. This is called um, near Mukteshwar. And currently we are hosting the largest uh, optical and infrared telescope from this part of the globe. We are proud to have this uh, telescope, which is also called the uh, Devastal uh, Optical Telescope, 3.6 meter. This other telescope, which is a smaller telescope, uh, 1.3 meter. This is, I uh, often say, this is our student's PhD student star, because this is completely dedicated to our PhD students. Uh, even the faculties don't get the preference for utilizing this. Uh, so the proposal uh, has the highest priority if it is there from a PhD student and they get uh, you know months of observations from this. More recently, we have uh, got this four meter liquid mirror telescope. This is a very, very unique uh, you know, facility, one of its kind in the globe now for astronomical research. Four meter is a pretty large mirror. But rather than uh, standard glass uh, surface as a reflecting surface, we use mercury. We rotate it in a ball, and that takes the shape of the ball, which is a paraboloid mirror. And uh, of course, there is some disadvantage in the sense, you know, we can't turn this uh, mirror, but it always looks at the zenith. It's a fantastic new facility, which will be inaugurated formally on 21st March, and you will hear more about it in, in the media. This is the toy of our PhD students, which I was referring to. And you could see the, I think Himalayas in the background. So it's not a bad place to work. Uh, and in the morning tea, you can enjoy with the view of the sunrise from these Himalayas. This is the four meter liquid meter, meter telescope, which I was referring to. Here you see that people wearing PPEs because mercury is not a very friendly substance. So you have to be a little careful about handling mercury. And we had these PPE uh, you know, dresses for last four or five years, much before the pandemic started. So uh, we already had in the campus uh, several PPEs actually, when somebody got sick, uh, we didn't have to you know, really uh, rush. So this is a very unique facility um, and uh, the data which is going to be collected from this telescope, we will plan to uh, you know, make it uh, open as soon as possible. I'm, I'm working hard for that. Essentially this data will have millions of objects in the same frame, you will have uh, you know, a space debris, you can have a comet, you can have a galaxy, you can have a gamma ray uh, source as well. So how you identify these different sources and how do you characterize them, how do you track them? It's a complete, uh, you know, automation and a perfect, you know, application for, you know, AIML. So uh, the data pipeline is under development with a lot of uh, students, including uh, one of our MTech PhD students. And I'm really, really looking forward to that uh, you know, new avenue completely. And I think being an IIT student and so on, you could actually explore your skill sets in this kind of uh, you know, new tool development for, for uh, artificial intelligence as well. So this is, as I mentioned, our nation's pride now, 3.6 meter Devastal optical telescope. And as I mentioned also, our students do enjoy their life. This is a picture taken by one of our students. We had a young astronomer's meet very recently. They publicized uh, this uh, picture as well. And you see the telescope and the star trail. So that's background. Now let me come to our star, uh, my topic today. It's our nearest star and it's in the middle age. You don't have to worry about too much, uh, but this star is there and that uh, dictates our existence. And also it provides all the energy uh, to earth as well. But it really a special star because it really allows us to verify our different you know, physics understanding. You have lots of theories which comes up, but a new theory only remains as a hypothesis unless it is experimentally verified. 
but that experiment often is not possible in the terrestrial environment. So we need to go astrophysical environment to verify those uh, new theories and sun provides us an ideal laboratory. Now comes, comes this variability, which I was referring to. So sun like all stars is a very dynamic star and always active and it is always changing. So here you see a, a, a movie of a, a solar uh, outer atmospheric image. This is also called the coronal part of the you know, uh, solar atmosphere. And this is taken from Solar Dynamic Observatory. And as you see here in this image, there are regions where things are brighter as compared to the other surrounding regions. These bright regions are called active regions. And now we understand all these active regions are filled with strong presence of magnetic field. So underneath there is a, a magnetic field and that you know, provides these kind of structures. Sometimes these structures are stable for a while, but they become unstable. And then whatever material is confined within this structure, you see they are you know, through into the interplanetary space and some of the material may fall back to the sun and some will travel into the interplanetary space and reach our neighborhood as well. So now to understand these uh, you know, ejecta, why they're coming at certain times, and if they come, what kind of implications or what kind of effect it will have in our near -earth environment and all that, that's a subject area which Aditya will focus as well. Before I go into you know, this um, particular object called active region, which is composed of a lot of uh, strong magnetic field regions. Always you have to look back at the history. This is the history of, uh, you know, uh, of the detection of sunspot by Galileo. Uh, he just uh, started looking at uh, the, you know, at the sun. And this is an animation what you see here, which is just his everyday drawing has been made with moved into a animation. So here also you see that these uh, locations where there are these spots, these are called sunspots now. And these uh, sunspots on a subsequent day was seen to be moving to the right. And that led to Galileo to think that uh, probably sun is rotating about its own axis as well. So Galileo and uh, Christoph noticed that the sunspots move across the solar disk in accordance with the rotation of a round body. Of course, he didn't know at that point of time it's not a solid body, but it actually rotates differentially that will come, come later on. But this was an important uh, you know, observation from Galileo and think about you know, the time, you know, just that telescope has been invented, how the, uh, you know, uh, these kind of individuals had such a vision to look at uh, uh, these newly, uh, you know, discovered, with the newly discovered telescope on these objects. Someday, if I look at the sun with, uh, these are called white light images. The other one also was drawing, but it was taken from a white light. That means, you know, you allow lots of wavelength to pass. And then what you see uh, is the solar surface image. Someday, you know, you don't find any sunspots at all. It's pretty boring. Some other day you find this kind of pairs of sunspots. Uh, if you focus on this, these are called uh, sunspots. And if I just uh, zoom a little more, and we have much better, you know, telescopes nowadays, we see that they often come in pairs as well. They don't come in isolation. So here you see, uh, and for a comparison, you see the size of the Earth. So these magnetic structures, how big they are, and they're confining all this plasma. So how much material they can confine, you can imagine. So this is a cut at the surface, but. If I have to go up in the atmosphere, I will see they are like cylinders, you know. Uh, they are uh, the anchored regions. You can think about them as uh, big pillars. And these pillars may not be also like the fixed uh, sizes. They will actually expand as, the, uh, as they go up in the atmosphere because the atmosphere is lighter. So how these sunspots come from? Sunspots are magnetic structures and they emerge from beneath the surface. So I only showed you the surface uh, thing. So here you see that these kind of white lines, which are uh, represented by magnetic field lines, you have done experiments on, I think, you know, standard magnets uh, in your school or, or college experiments. There you will see that if you put iron fillings, you know that the, you know, iron fillings takes a particular path. They're called magnetic field lines, right? 
If you have millions of magnetic field lines and compose it into a tube, they're called magnetic flux tube. So what is shown here are uh, in animations of magnetic flux tubes. These flux tubes are generated inside the sun at the base of the convection zone. You just consider them to be underneath the sun. And then since they are lighter as compared to surrounding, they pop up and they form these kind of pairs of sunspot. And uh, as you will see uh, from this animation again, that um, after they come, they're looking at like they're this kind of steady kind of uh, you know, structures, but suppose you, know, you provide some little bit of twist or motion of these tubes, then they will not stand there. So what will happen is here you see that they're interacting with each other and then there is a process called flare or reconnection. And then the material which was uh, confined within this is thrown into the interplanetary space. So this is the source of the solar storm. So we'll talk about the uh, solar storm. But again, this is a variability or, or you can see the time scales of these changes are minutes to hours, you know, maximum to days. So these tubes are stable for a while and but then it becomes unstable because they are lighter uh, as I told before as well. So this is a some kind of time variability which has a direct impact on our near earth environment, which we call space weather as well. There is another kind of variability which we have to worry about is now if we plot the total sunspot number for last 400 years, I see this kind of behavior. So here what is plotted is the sunspot number. As I mentioned, someday there are few sunspots, sometimes there are many sunspots, sometimes there are no sunspots at all. So if you just record that sunspot as seen on a daily basis and plot it over the last 400 years, you will find this kind of cyclic behavior. So what is to be noted here is there are period over which there are plenty of sunspots and the solar activity is in the, in the maximum phase, we call it. And there are period, there are almost no sunspots at all. These are called the minima period. And this amplitude, what you see also is not always uniform. There are certain cycles which are much, much stronger as compared to other ones. Incidentally, Samuel Swabe, he observed for this period, the sunspot number. And think again about these indigenous guys, he only seen this, you know, period observations, and he said the uh, sunspot cycle. There is a cycle which is called solar cycle. So, with a very limited number of, uh, you know, data points, they have this vision to think about, you know, something more. Of course, if you have the whole data, very clearly there is a typically eleven-year kind of periodicity, but uh, the amplitudes do change, and there are lots of variation. It's not always eleven years; it can be, you know, ten to thirteen years, and so on. There was also a period over which there were no sunspots. That's a mystery. Uh, this was, uh, you know, uh, discovered by Maunder, and its impact has direct consequence on our climate. I will probably come back to. It. So why I'm showing this plot is, we see that different type of variability on the magnetic activity on the sun is recorded now. There are long term variability of yearly. Then actually, if you go back. If you can generate proxy data and go back to carbon dating or I score, you can build this data for several thousands of years. And we see there are other periodicities, longer periodicities are also present. And we still do not understand very clearly uh, those long periods, but it is quite inevitable that there would be other periodicities the moment we discover longer and longer time series as well. So the point is, all these different kind of changes will have impact on our climate, on our you know existence, because at the end of the day, as I mentioned, the total solar radiance uh, uh, luminosity needs to be constant, but it is not strictly constant. There is a 0.01% variation with the solar cycle. That itself has some impact, but if it goes beyond 0.01, there could be devastating effect. So the global warming, what, whatever we are causing, it's not, incidentally, it's not really sun to be blamed. Uh, it is us, we should be blamed for that. And there are, uh, you know, there were period over which, uh, you know, some communities, particularly the business communities were trying to push it to the source. Uh, sun uh, is probably responsible for so much of heat. We are already, you know, not able to keep this on in, in February. Uh, so, but in reality, it is us, uh, the global warming is not caused by the sun, but it's more our responsibility. So here again, it is uh, shown for the last 400 years of uh, sunspot records. 
but you also see with the solar cycle that different emissions here uh, you know how they this is a image uh, taken from a uh, chromospheric line called h alpha we get uh, about 1500 kilometers from the surface of the sun if you have the image taken then uh, you see that the activity is uh, changing with uh, you know uh, with more complex uh, regions and so on it is more dramatic if you look at the X-ray images. So here it is shown from solar maxima, the X-ray image. This is outermost uh, you know, layers of the atmosphere of the sun in terms of the coronal heights. And wherever there is a strong uh, you know, magnetic field presence, you have much more emission in X-rays. And when it goes to the solar minima, there is not much magnetic field in terms of the concentrated uh, you know, uh, sunspot regions. And you see a dramatic change in the X-ray emission as well. So this is uh, called the solar cycle. And I always uh, try to advertise that in India as well, we have enormous source in terms of studying this long-term uh, study. This is our own uh, observatory at Kodekinal. And we have been looking at the sun, well, not me, my predecessors and uh, their uh, you know, predecessors more than 100 years. And uh, uh, the record existed in terms of the photographic plates and the films and so on. It has been all digitized and made it into the public domain completely. So this again shows how important is scientific archiving? Because if you want to study something which is long-term changes, see, if you have only data for 10 years, 20 years, it will not work for you because you are looking at 11 year cycle. And as I showed you that the cycle periodicity, amplitude, everything changes dramatically. And there are periods over which, you know, it has no resemblance with the normal uh, cycle at, at all. So it is very important to go back to the historical data for any science for that matter. So uh, this is a, example and i normally try to advertise this uh, enormous resource uh, which is now available in the public domain now i will also highlight another important aspect in terms of astronomy is the multi wavelength capacity you know when you look at the sun uh, only in optical white light you see it doesn't look so promising you know of course you have some small little dot here of course there is a sunspot there but when you look at the same object from multi wavelengths, so this is an infrared uh, you know, uh, image. Infrared uh, telescopes are there, high altitude mountains, you can do it. But of course, in space also, you will be able to do it much better. And this is a, a same uh, you know, image of the sun taken with extreme ultraviolet, which again probes, uh, say, 0.8 million to 1 million K uh, plasma. And again, this is an X ray image, uh, same day, same time. Uh, and you see, that you know how much complexity you are able to see. It's the same sun, but that proves that the structures are there, many different structures are there, which has many different temperatures and densities and so on. So if you want to probe all these structures, then you need to have a capability of observing them through the multi-wavelength because multi-wavelength allows you to probe even different thermal plasma. Hotter the plasma, it emits shorter and shorter wavelengths. So principally, unless you go to the space, you are not able to access the you know, shorter wavelengths, particularly here. So that's the beauty of going to space. And after the space era only, we are able to know about majority of the astronomical or astrophysical uh, you know, scenarios much better. And sun is no exception. So uh, really it has changed dramatically. Solar physics seems to be a sort of not very fascinating subject for youngsters. When I started my PhD in early nineties, I did all theory. Uh, uh, observational astronomy, I mean, solar data was not available within the country. So there was not really, I mean, high resolution data, I will put it that way. So uh, until the space era, when the data became in the public domain, the things have got into a completely different you know, regime altogether. You will find students from Asia, uh, you know, extensively using data from NASA and ESA missions. And uh, this understanding of the coupled atmosphere of the sun, because we know that the magnetic field is most important element, which is responsible for this confinement, but then these structures, how they evolve with time, how they expand with time and eventually become unstable and make, gives rise to these ejectas, you know, is only we are able to understand once we had a multi-wavelength uh, approach to the subject. Again, a, just a uh, crude example, if I look at the photosphere, uh, I see this pair of sunspot. If I 
go up in the atmosphere a little bit. This is again a calcium image. I see the same sunspot, but the surrounding looks very different. If I now flip flop, you will see that the background, you see the small little cellular pattern. These are called granules. These are direct manifestation of convection, which is happening underneath the sun. And when we go to lower chromosphere and look at uh, with the calcium uh, filter or so, I still see these uh, small structures, but I see a larger structure also. These are called super granules. And of course, I see the sunspot again. I go uh, slightly higher up in the chromosphere. This is with the H alpha line. You see the same sunspot uh, locations, but you see many more filamentary structures. These are called filamentary you know, uh, structures. And obviously you can imagine that the magnetic field is distributed is or expanded to a very, very different regime when we are in the upper in the atmosphere. And if I go farther up, I see the corona. Of course, uh, I see the very bright loop system where plasma is mainly confined by very, very big extended uh, loop kind of system and other portions do not emit that much as it appears dark. Of course, still the sunspot is there right below. So what happens is that now I know that the atmosphere of the sun is basically has this kind of temperature profile. You have a surface temperature about 6,000 Kelvin or so. Then as expected, when you go away from the surface, initially the temperature drops because that would happen in Earth's atmosphere or any planetary atmosphere as well. But beyond 500 kilometers, we see again temperature going up. So that is a, a, used to be a mystery a couple of uh, decades back, but now we have lots of understanding that why this temperature is uh, going higher. What are the different agents which can supply this kind of uh, energy? No normal thermodynamics will be able to explain to you. So there are a no, lot of non-thermal processes which are invoked to explain this temperature profile. So as you can see here, the lower corona is already into the millions of Kelvin temperature. So what is important to again, map these uh, active regions from different uh, filters. Again, as you see here, uh, these are the locations of the sunspots. This is taken uh, you know, from the photospheric layers. This is up in the corona. You see these structures much, much wider and expanded. This is something representing 304 angstrom, again, a helium filter, which uh, shows you the chromospheric thing. So when you look at the chromosphere, you see the same loop systems are not so big but they're slightly smaller in size. Whereas if you go to the corona, you will find much, much bigger loop system. And all of them are connected at the end of the day to these foot points. So these are my foot points, you know. So it is important to find out where those foot points are, how they're evolving, whether their size is growing, whether they're decaying, whether uh, two foot points are coming closer to each other, whether there is motions, uh, you know, across. All these will dictate, you know, what is going to happen to the future of these active regions. So that's why, again, I'm highlighting that how important it is uh, to study the multi-wavelength. I will show you another movie. Uh, as I said, these are called active regions, and these are called so-called quiet region. Hmm? It was historically to called quiet, but uh, really in the sun, nothing is quiet because you know magnetic field is there actually everywhere. And I will show you one uh, work of uh, one of my former students. He combined data from, again, ground-based observatory and space-based observatory. This is uh, extreme ultraviolet space uh, uh, data you can look at. Now we focus on a very quiet region. So if you look at, this is uh, from Goody uh, Solar Telescope. This is one of the large telescopes in the US. And we look at the granules. And you see this uh, granules are motions and all that. Then what you see is in the upper chromosphere with H alpha line, he could uh, identify these jets. So these are you know, very tiny little spiky, uh, you know, uh, jets. Where are these jets coming from? They are coming from the locations where these opposite polarities, two polarities are represented. Let me, uh, you know, sorry, go back and uh, stop the movie somewhere. Oops. Or maybe I can explain it in this way as well. So in the same stuff, what it shows here is, that you have these magnetic field uh, you know, locations where opposite polarities are represented by blue and, and, and red. Whenever there is a cancellation of this, that are the, those are the locations where these jets are formed. And these jets, so here what is shown is observations taken at multiple layers with different filters. 
are mapping with different heights in the atmosphere of the sun. And here you see the locations where these jets are, are corresponding to the locations where you see high emission in the corona. So these are called brightening in the corona, which has been observed from space uh, observatory. So these uh, data is from ground-based observatory. This is from the space-based observatory. So you see that how important it is the, to combine uh, you know, resources from uh, different uh, you know, observatories located at different platforms. Otherwise, if we would have restricted only to the coronal observations, then you would not have seen the source of this brightening. And at the same time, since we have uh, these multi-layer observations or multi-wavelength observations, we are able to even track that where these jets are coming, the jets are coming exactly locations where the magnetic cancellations are happening. And these jets are co-temporal. We also look at the time information is when the brightening is happening. So this is a complete story of uh, you know, uh, this thing, uh, which is possible now. So as I indicated, so these are the storms, which we call above sunspots when they become tangled, violent storms burst into the sun. This is the main source of our strongest space weather. This terminology, uh, space weather has come, like you know, if you want to go to space, uh, make a uh, travel to the space, you need to know whether it is safe to travel to space. It's like, you know, I remember in our early days, if you have to go out to the coastal areas, you see the radio uh, was uh, often used by the, by the fishermen. They will listen to the radio first thing in the morning, whether it is uh, you know, safe to the, go to the sea for fishing. So here, uh, our space agencies ask us whether it is safe to you know, go to space or launch uh, now, uh, because if there could be a storm and then the satellite could be lost incidentally. There were 37 satellites which was launched, I uh, mean, lost just a few months back. SpaceX uh, launched uh, several, yeah, I think uh, 40 was launched. They say 37 was completely destroyed somewhere, you know, sort of uh, recoverable or something like that they mentioned. So uh, they launched, uh, you know, 40 satellites. And what happened was there was a, uh, you know, event in the sun, which did not, I mean, they didn't anticipate to be that big, but what happens is you always do not need to have a very big flare any small little impact can also change the environment, the near uh, Earth environment. And in this particular case, it changed the drag which you normally experience in space because there is, it is a disturbance. So the satellite, their, op, their path was disturbed. Whatever their you know, uh, satellite uh, trajectory would have been in a normal uh, quiet condition was disturbed, which didn't anticipate and uh, they lost the satellite. So, Losing 37 satellites is not a uh, you know a very cheap uh, thing, so that's why uh, we are getting good funding also these days. So, so I think this is a really really a new avenue, and um, uh, this is just one example. The other example is very rich people want to go to space to build new colonies or or uh, their uh, you know uh, whatever their uh, new locations and they have money to support us also because it's not safe to travel uh, in space really. I mean, majority of the conditions, it won't be safe. Of course, you have to look at the solar minima, then you have to wait for another probably seven years when the minima appears and the rich people do not have much time. Uh, so, so that way, uh, this is again, bringing in a lot of avenues in terms of uh, prediction of the space weather conditions. And that demands observation that demands uh, modeling, that demands uh, prediction capabilities, and uh, they are not straightforward as well, because no two scene is the same, no two storms are same. So that means you have to study thousands of uh, such events to find out common commonalities. And uh, again, there is a huge scope for artificial intelligence as well. If you have large data, then you can train your uh, you know, system with the similarities and dissimilarities and so on. And that will allow you to do predictions. So artificial intelligence is very, very heavily used now uh, for space weather predictions as well. But again, we are still far away from uh, making really 100% predictions. Still, I, I hear that it is only uh, 50 to 60% uh, with reliability, you can do a space weather uh, proper prediction because it's just not the sun and near sun environment. You have to really understand the sun, earth, the entire atmosphere, what the pre, uh, you know, conditions, because these ejecta has to travel through this medium, which is not uh, void. It has, uh, you know, 
plasma, it has magnetic field. So all these interactions need to be studied. So here in this movie, you saw there was a, uh, a storm. So this material which were confined, you saw that they got ejected. And then at the end of the clip, you saw these white little uh, you know, spikes. They are all highly energetic particles hitting the camera. You know, and if you're, it is your normal camera, it will get uh, lost, I mean, destroyed also. We have sophisticated cameras uh, to you know, protect uh, from this. We again flood it completely. And of course, it has to be almost like a reset to uh, you know, get it to the normal usage. So these particles are also very, very harmful. So as I indicated, it's not going to be very pleasant for us as well if we want to travel in space, uh, as you see here in this particular uh, example. So solar flares are quick, intense, but smaller explosions than coronal mass ejection. I will show you example. They appear as uh, bright uh, flashes, sometimes followed by burst of high energy particles uh, that can travel half the speed of the light. Large flares can occur several times a year when the sun is near its peak activity. So as I mentioned, depending on whether you have lots of active region or uh, activity, then the probability of having many more flares are more and minimum period you will have less probability because you do need uh, you know, active regions to have uh, strong flares. And this uh, clip is again uh, affected by this, it is shown. So uh, here again, it is uh, you know, showing that uh, the, the capability or the beauty of using multi-wavelength observation. Here you see again a UV uh, image from a space platform, how this uh, you know, flare is uh, resulting into this ejecta and going out here. But then we have to, and this is the location uh, where it got uh, ejected. So it is important to really, really track uh, all of them together. So <clears throat> coronal mass ejections are large storms that can blast out cloud billions of tons of particles, all over 2 million kilometers per hour. And the smaller ones are occur almost you know, any day. So here it is an example of a uh, you know, CME. You have a large uh, you know, structure here. Uh, sometimes they are called uh, filaments. And these filaments are confining a, a huge amount of uh, plasma, and then where uh, they're unstable, the plasma which is confined will be, you know, ejected here, and the clouds reach Earth of orbit in one to three days. So essentially, you do have some time for prediction uh, for the cloud to uh, arrive, and uh, that way it becomes very important. The moment you observe, then you feed that into your computer, uh, you know, predictive model so that you, know, you still have few hours to run those models and, and really talk about when it is going to arrive. Because what is important is the arrival time of this cloud uh, when it comes to near Earth environment here. So here you see it's a full disk image of the same event, but then uh, if I want to really follow it uh, up there, so I need to block the solar disk and then look at these uh, uh, guys uh, as they go uh, away. So these devices are called the coronagraph, so we block the solar disk. It's like total solar eclipse kind of situation. And then we try to follow these uh, ejecta as it travels here. So you can see uh, in, from this movie also, it's not a very, very pleasant uh, place to be when such a storm happens. And uh, the sun is also a source of radiation uh, and storms what we call as uh, space weather here. And here you see again, uh, such CME being recorded from uh, from uh, stereo spacecraft. This is again a NASA uh, twin telescope uh, uh, spacecraft. And uh, I'm sure uh, you won't be very happy to be here uh, when such a storm uh, happens. So this is what is called a uh, space weather. And it's important that we uh, track it. Again, from the stereo, what uh, people have done, they have combined data. This is a full disk imager. This is one coronagraph. This is another coronagraph. These are called heliospheric imager, heliospheric imager one and heliospheric imager two, which is for the first time allowed us to really track these ejecta, or the CMEs as it comes out of the sun all the way to earth. So here you see, you can also in, in general study other planetary interactions as well, if you have you know, full coverage. So in future, we are planning to have almost 360 degree coverage of uh, the space so that we can track all the ejecta which is coming from the sun. So this is the you know, way forward to map them. And for that, you need multiple instruments. Just one mission alone will not be able to do it as well. So, uh, so what is space weather? Space weather refers to the changes in the space environment, primarily near Earth, because we are bothered about this near Earth environment. And as you know, 
near earth environment we are protected because of the earth's magnetic field if earth's magnetic field would not have they been there i think our existence would not have been possible as well that's one of the uh, you know also people work on uh, other planets and so on particularly in other uh, you know non solar systems and uh, the whether there is a life possible or not one of the main condition is whether the planet has a magnetic field or not because its atmosphere will be you know uh, completely destroyed also by these uh, continuous things which is coming from the sun as well so uh, the sun energy is in the form of the light the it form in the particles and the magnetic field and there are different kinds of time scales of variability as i indicated there are sun rotates about uh, its own axis about one uh, you know in in one month 27 days so in this 27 days you can imagine since the you know active regions are also changing location the 3d space environment will also com uh, completely change so that provides a some kind of variability typically the active region there is a consensus that there uh, you know there is a 100 day kind of uh, you know stuff which which allows this active region to evolve and that also will produce you know some type of variability and of course 11 years is uh, pretty well known incidentally the sun the polarity has uh, you know also flips every 11 years so this is called polarity reversal this also need to be explained so there are lots of you know different time type of variability which is uh, necessary to be explained and that is what we call about uh, about space weather but as i indicated that we live in the atmosphere of the sun basking in its light and warmth protected by our magnetic shield and normally the magnetic field would, should have been like this but since there is a continuous you know uh, material flow from the sun this is also called the solar wind so solar wind is a steady flow which has also its own variability as well but on the top of the solar wind there are these cmes and the big big ejecta which is coming and that changes our earth's uh, you know near earth environment as well and one needs to study this and in fact uh, you know that when such a uh, huge uh, you know uh, particles uh, come normally if i go back to the previous slide <clears throat> normally you see the particles cannot penetrate or cross these magnetic field lines what what they do is they guide it about this magnetic field lines and they try to enter to the polar regions because that's a sort of you know uh, entry point for these uh, you know highly energetic particles when they interact with the with the earth's atmosphere you get this beautiful auroras and and uh, that's again typically seen in the you know either in the high latitude region like the alaska and uh, you know uh, or, or the scandinavian countries and so on so that's the beauty of the aurora in addition when these uh, highly energetic particles and the magnetic uh, elements they are interacting with our uh, you know our communication system so here you see direct impact of uh, radio communications there is impact of our electric power system because as, as you know any charged particles if they interact with our power grid system they will have induced currents and then you can will have a breakdown of those of course uh, the you know we are very much dependent on our whatsapp messages to be delivered so if the gps navigation uh, doesn't work uh, you know sometimes that uh, you know navigation systems also gives uh, and google will take us to somewhere else uh, it also directly impacts the satellites as i indicated so we are essentially um, living in this space and uh, this is what the ionosphere is very much important for our communication system and uh, you know all these ejecta or the particles which are coming they are directly impacting the ionosphere and whatever is our assets in the ionosphere or the near earth environment they get directly impacted so this is a cartoon picture which shows the areas where the you know uh, uh, you know space weather effects are to be uh, worried about uh, i gave you an example about the atmospheric drag which can uh, completely deflect the trajectories of satellites uh, astronauts safety uh, we are talking about you new know, missions from our own platform and there is a huge amount of uh, in fact uh, requirement for biologists uh, to work with isro uh, this is again a classic example of multidisciplinarity see any mission now really demands you know all kinds of specializations whether you call it engineering specialization physics chemistry biology you know uh, you name it and of course mathematicians always are required for giving us new solutions 
so um, in a way this really really demands a you know sort of a total effect i would say total uh, contribution and with that we have this mission uh, called aditya l1 because we are trying to go to a location called lagrange in one point it's a pretty long journey uh, this is a uh, indigenously you know uh, make it india project because all the payloads are completely developed within the country at different labs there are primary you know four institutions where uh, you know these different hardwares are being uh, you know uh, made in the labs but there are people from all over i mean from even iit or uh, aries or isers they are somewhere or other involved with the you know science mission and we hope that this you know distribution of logo is not limited so we would hope that in coming years you know more and more institution will join to actively start using the aditya data and being part of uh, a member of this it has uh, seven payloads this is the full list i will talk about it uh, a little bit more so this is the uh, you know journey we will will launch from here and then we'll make a few rounds like this you know uh, when you have done a uh, thing with the throwing a stone also sometimes you know you do change the uh, uh, orbital uh, parameters and then throw the guy out so sling effect so this is what we will try to do it's pretty large distance 1.5 million kilometers i must admit you know when first time isro came and they approached us and they said would you like to go to lagrange in one point in fact to be honest you know i was involved with this mission more than 15 years uh initially we only planned for a, a small satellite program with one payload the coronagraph there were no other payloads there and then uh, suddenly isro uh, had, had a very successful mangalayan mission so isro once more uh, you know challenging task i mean going to 500 km 600 km is baby's walk now for isro so uh, it doesn't excite them anymore it looks like so in fact it was isro who came to us and says that uh, we have an opportunity uh, you can go to l1 i said of course we can we would love to go to l1 but why with one payload then because if you are going to l1 means you know it has to be big satellite it has to be big uh, platform it can carry many more uh, instruments so one became seven so it's a uh, not small jump you know uh, sometimes it fine you know we are taking big steps you know not small small steps so you can imagine the complexity which will uh, demand from 1 to 7 payloads so it's a combination of uh, four remote sensing uh, instruments remote sensing means you know we are going to be at lagrangian one well we are not exactly at lagrangian one point we are going to make a very big halo orbit around lagrangian one but lagrangian one provides us a very good stable platform because once you reach there you really need very little fuel to stay there in the orbit because typically crudely uh, speaking it's the force between the satellite and the sun uh, it balances between the force between you know uh, the satellite and earth so that way you know uh, it's a much much more stable location and uh, remotely we will be looking at the sun with the coronagraph as i showed you more images that we are interested in the outer uh, layers of the atmosphere and when this ejecta comes out to track them and so on we will also look at the full disk uh, you know images with this suit instrument then we have two x ray spectrometers which will look at all these uh, flares there are small flares there are large flares so to you know look at very different type of flares we need uh, you know uh, multiple instruments with also spectral capability this is again another very important element in terms of modern day astronomy is to see the images will give you pretty pictures but at the end of the day Uh, it doesn't allow you to probe the plasma its uh, plasma conditions its speed you know its temperature density uh, so for that you need actually spectroscopic capability so this is a very important element for the youngsters also should know that uh, if you really want to do uh, well in astrophysics you have to have a good combination of imaging capabilities and spectroscopic capabilities so that's why the physics becomes much more interesting as well so thankfully in this particular mission we have the perfect combinations of that we have spectrometers we have images uh, and we have even spectro polarimeters so this is again a new instrument which is used for magnetic field measurements and so on and then 
in addition, we have three uh, particle detectors, uh, which will detect the properties of these energetic particles and this magnetic cloud and detector, their compositions, their magnetic properties, and so on. Uh, there are only very few items which is listed here. I mean, I can go on, you know, they can like already 50, you know, objectives which you can, because you can imagine it is a really, really major observatory in space. We didn't start with that, you know, uh, 15 years back. Now the opportunities are enormous. And as it happens in science, most of my interesting work actually has come out of nothing. We never had a early uh, indication that this kind of results we are going to get. So uh, often, you know, that's why, you know, we get more excited that you have not expected something and you've got something new. So but although there is always, you'll find the major objective, of course, you can say that I want to understand why the corona is hot, why this, there is a wind and then how did the wind get accelerated? These are all very global names, but the finer details are makes, makes it uh, more interesting as well. So uh, the list of uh, instruments again, uh, the corona graph, which has four different cameras as well. So this is again a unique thing. This is quite, uh, we are fortunate that such a big elephant we are flying in space and uh, nowhere else actually in the uh, space platform, any agency will not allow to fly something 175 kg weight, you know? This is unbelievable. We are young and, uh, you know, so uh, I think ISRO has taken our pampering uh, <laughs> with their heart and allowed us to build such a, a you know a huge huge uh, payload that allows us enormous new opportunities so we have you know, normally you know uh, people will not have a combination of spectroscopic and imaging and spectropolarimetry capability so here in this co corona graph for the first time we have such capabilities because we have a very big uh, you know uh, payload then we have the suit payload this is called solar ultraviolet imaging telescope so the Corona Graph is uh, primarily built at IA's uh, Hasekote campus in Bangalore. It has been delivered. And I was uh, told also the, it was successful to have uh, passed the vibration test because we were all very worried because once you take these kind of payloads and put it into you know, this kind of shaking, uh, we don't know things will loosen up. At least our body would have, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but it appears that they are all in good place and uh, we are ready for, for flying. Solar ultraviolet imaging telescope is going to operate in 200 to 400 nanometers. And uh, it has many different filters. It will probe from all the way from the surface to the chromospheric height. So this is the complementarity. Coronagraph will look at the corona. Suit will look at the lower atmosphere. It's uh, primarily built at Ayuka and now been in, uh, in, uh, in Bangalore in uh, eyesight for, for many months now, uh, ready for final delivery. These are the two payloads, uh, particle detectors. So the aspect team is here. You will hear more interesting talks uh, tomorrow in our workshop. These are going to look at the solar wind and uh, the energy distribution. Uh, uh, so one is built at uh, PRL Ahmedabad, the, uh, all delivered. I saw the pictures in the Indigo flight, how it was uh, taken from Ahmedabad to Bangalore. Uh, and then the Papa is built in, in, in Trivandrum. Uh, there are two... Uh, X-ray, uh, you know, spectrometers, one works in the low energy and the other one is uh, slightly at the high energy. Again, the high energy one is built at uh, PRL along with the colleagues from uh, Udaipur. And uh, then finally, there is a magnetometer, uh, which is going to measure the magnetic uh, fields of these uh, big magnetic clouds as it travels. So that will allow us to also understand whether this magnetic cloud is going to make an impact and all that. Why I'm saying this is it's not always that all the magnetic clouds will have actually big impact when it interacts with Earth's magnetosphere. Because the Earth's magnetosphere also has a orientation of the magnetic field. You see the direction property of a magnetic field is very, very important. So if it is there, there are some places, uh, sometimes if they are, uh, you know, these magnetic clouds have one particular orientation, it will not have such impact as well. So that's the mission. Uh, we have all the, uh, you know, uh, payloads at different places. And as I told, the big elephant is sitting on the top deck, the Corona graph, and sidewise, this uh, suit instruments and other uh, instruments are mostly hanging around from different uh, locations. 
uh, of course, uh, Aspects has a little tower uh, with uh, some more directional properties. You will hear about more. So there, for the first time, actually, you are going to have a you know a sense of where these things are coming from. Uh, because sometimes, you know, if you just look at it from one direction, you won't get a 3D picture of this. So uh, again, highlighting that this is a multi-payload observatory class mission, observatory class mission, not individual payload uh, type for looking at the sun for the first time from Indian platform. Multi-wavelength also covers different atmospheric layers that I have tried to indicate. Uh, combination of remote sensing and in-situ observation establishing the connection between the source and the in-situ, right? Something is coming from the source, which is the sun, but whether that, that guy, when it travels, whether it is going to reach earth or if it reaches earth, what would be the impact? You need to really find out in from in-situ measurement. Like, you know, uh, if I have to measure uh, his uh, thermal temperature from a distance, I can measure, there are ways now, but if I put a thermometer and uh, take the temperature, it will be much more accurate. So that's the combination I'm talking about. Remotely, you get a sense of what it is uh, coming. And then through the in-situ observation, you confirm that. And that will actually allow you to, you know, really predict about this, you know, uh, impact, what it is expected. So with all that uh, mission, it is also important to build a user community. And uh, typically in the past, what has happened is the people who have built the instruments, they know about the data and they use the data maximum. But nowadays it is our responsibility that we try to enlarge the scope and we bring in many more people or user to use the data. And unless we do that, really the usefulness of this mission doesn't come out. I mean, frankly speaking, the amount of data it will collect now, some 40, 50 people, if they look at it, only 1% of the data will be looked at. 99% of the data will not be even looked at. So it is important to have a really, really larger, you know, user base for this. And with that hope, you know, uh, this support cell has been uh, created uh, again, thanks to ISRO. And they have initiated this much before the launch. So we are making, uh, you know, uh, the community aware and particularly the youngsters, because unless you have uh, smart people like you, uh, we take uh, two days to analyze something and you take only two minutes. Uh, so uh, we need uh, smarter, uh, you know, younger people to look at the data. But before you could look at the data, you need certain background, what to look for. And then there are obviously sometimes, you know, problem with the data, which you may not be aware and you will interpret it wrongly. So to have that uh, knowledge, you know, it is important to have such a regular interaction. So that's with that, you know, we are here for this uh, support cell uh, workshop. And I'm hoping that after three days, uh, we'll have a few more users. And if uh, those who are even not attending the workshop, you're most welcome to join the next work workshop. Uh, we'll have it in Nainital, in that beautiful location for 10 days. So I'm looking forward to your uh, active participations and uh, I invite you to enjoy this uh, uh, Himalayan range. And that's a logo uh, or the sticker of Aditya L1 mission. Thank you for your attention. So I'm open for questions, please, uh, you know, somebody has to coordinate the questions uh, here. I'm not sure about uh, online participants. Um, yeah, there are a few, but uh, yeah, just let me know how, how we uh, coordinate this. Probably first we can take questions uh, uh, from the in-person and later on, if you find time, we can take the online questions. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah can we use, uh, get, give him the microphone, please? Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, sir. I am a year to 30 year student from the upper panel of the year. And I think the my question is that in the, in the first part of the presentation, we said that the support was about the career level. Uh, the second is a case of work that is nature mission, but and the solar filters are very uh, uh, far uh, remote. So, without solar filters, how can you observe the sun? So actually, I should rephrase, uh, Galileo focused on this uh, sunspot observation, but 
probably people have somewhere or other, because there are historical evidences even before the telescope discovery, people knew about these uh, spots and so on and so forth. Because you basically need to have a, you know, uh, you don't look at the sun with this uh, telescope at all. Huh? So you just need to project an image into the you know, white sheet of paper, and then you get these the spots. You can even have a pinhole camera to, uh, you know, see the, uh, you know, uh, solar image. So sunspot observation did not demand a, you know, CLE, a Newtonian telescope, but of course, you know, without the telescope, uh, looking at the sky was not uh, there, but uh, Galileo observed not only the sunspot, but their movement. Sun, he didn't know the sunspots are magnetic region. He just noticed those spots, uh, dark, uh, you know, uh, regions, and the dark regions moving in the next day, which, which allowed him to predict that it is a rotating object as well. So uh, basically you don't need a filter really to, uh, if you want to really directly see it, of course you will need, but nobody actually need, should look at the sun even through a telescope. You always can project uh, the image. There are many uh, different ways. There's a series of mirrors also you can use to project the you know, solar image on a big screen. Uh, these are called silostrate kind of arrangements and so on. Yeah. Uh, we have a period of uh, modern humor, uh, so I want to ask you a question. Yeah, we, we are uh, sort of looking for it <laughs> because if it happens, it will give a completely new opportunity. Since you asked the question that now we have an understanding that it's probably a process called a dynamo, which is in action inside the sun, which is responsible for this solar cycle. Means you know this alteration of magnetic field going up and down and so on. And if you know about the solar internal rotation and the convection, how much it is, you can parameterize and so on and so forth, then you get a handle about this um, stuff. My other question is that means. You see, sun is a main sequence star. It cannot be that it was not rotating. It cannot be the convection also started. It's only possible that momentarily some other changes may have happened. It's actually, apart from this convection and rotation, there are some more parameters which are responsible for the dynamo to work. So there are models, including one from um, IIT, um, BHU of your colleague, uh, Dr. Vidya Karak. Uh, from their theoretical modeling, it predicts that, you know, probably there were some circulation patterns inside the sun, which gets a uh, little slowed down. And that has led to generation of the magnetic field, but this magnetic fields were weaker. And uh, that's why we, we did not see it from the earlier telescope time, because their time, you know, big telescopes were not available and all that. But having said that, there is a direct consequence of having not many sunspots or strong sunspots in our climate. I did not talk about it today. Uh, it was extremely cold in the earth. So, uh, so it is a real effect and something went uh, wrong. Now, what there are uh, theories which says that this kind of behavior can happen again another 400 years or 1000 years and so on. So there are models which uh, looks at it. In fact, uh, Bidya again has worked on the thing, how many such grand minima you can happen. So Bidya, do you have any prediction? When can this uh, next grand minima? I mean, before he answers it, basically the problem is uh, the solar predictions are only possible for near future. Like only we can do it for the next five, 10 years because of the nature of the nonlinear system it is. It is not a very simple sinusoidal, uh, you know, linear problem. Because of that, we are still not a position to predict way up in the future. Having said that, people are doing again, you know, a lot of data assimilation. They're doing uh, artificial intelligence, feeding the past data, whether that can predict, uh, you know, uh, future. But again, for very nonlinear system, it is difficult because how this coupling works and all that uh, is not very well understood. So definitely there will be a minima like monitor. When it is, we don't know. I think uh, that reasonably answers or they want to add something. Yeah. He's the uh, you know, dynamo guy.
There's a question in the back. Yeah, please don't hesitate to ask me questions. Uh, hopefully, I will be able to answer. Good evening, sir. Yeah. My name is Jeff from the Okay. So uh, again, I'm not a specialist from this because these are always uh, uh, secret things with the ISRO. They don't share too much <laughs> with us as well in terms of the trajectory. They will never publish uh, the path of the trajectories and so on. But uh, theoretically, what we understand that once you... So, since you asked this question, this is called injection point. See, you are going this, and then it's very, very crucial that you inject it in the right orbit. You know, Mangalayan also had the same, same big headache. If you are not able to capture that, you go into space. You cannot, I mean, to come back again, you need lots of fuel exercise and all that. So, uh, so here, any uh, sort of long distance travel, either you have to take Gravity assist of other planets. That's also another way. This is all in the ecliptic plane. Again, there are circumstances where we are trying to go out of the ecliptic plane. There are two NASA missions which are attempting to do that. I mean, attempted already successfully. So uh, some people are trying to reach much, much closer to the sun as well. So, uh, so here, Lagrangian want is comparatively, I would say, easier as compared to uh, the other out of ecliptic uh, missions. Uh, but that's what we know. And it is going to be a very, very huge hell orbit with a very slow movement around the Lagrangian one point, as it is depicted here in this picture. And always looking at the sun. The advantage is that you have a continuous view of the sun, right? If you have a low Earth orbit, because of the inclination of this orbit, you sometimes will have an eclipse in a low Earth orbit system, so which is not there here. But having said that, since you are going farther away, your telemetry is also a big problem. So how much data we can download and all that is again another chapter altogether. I hope that answers to some extent, but I don't have precise numbers and all that because it's very much uh, within their domain. Mm -hmm. In Sanskrit, Aditya means sun. Aditya means sun in Sanskrit. Aditya is a Sanskrit word which means sun. L1 is the Lagrangian one, but we have five Lagrangian points. And uh, incidentally, since you mentioned, I may have a slide of uh, the all five Lagrangian points. And uh, you know, the James Webb is at L2. Uh, it's behind the earth. Uh, because it is under the shadow of uh, this and all that. And uh, uh, if we are in future lucky, we may travel to L5 as well. You can see how far it is. And I want to know that is there any, uh, we always, I want to know about the algebra. So, is there a consequence of algebraic in the solar atmosphere or solar? Yes, Alvin waves are very, very important in uh, in the solar context. See, what you mentioned is uh, magnetic reconnection is uh, because of the realignment of the magnetic field lines. So, they normally do not like to talk to each other, but if you force them to interact, then uh, you know you get a reconnectivity after uh, this reconnection process. And during that reconnection process, you have a possibility of converting this magnetic energy into heat and acceleration and so on. Alvin waves will be always there in an atmosphere where there is a presence of magnetic field. Traditionally, classical Alvin waves are transverse wave. It's like you have a stretch string, hmm? any string instrument you have, you plug the string, you create a transverse wave. Hmm? Think about these magnetic field lines as a stretch string. And this magnetic field lines provides a tension. Why this, uh, you know, in the musical instrument, why it happens? Because there is a tension. Because the two nodes are there. Huh? And then you create nodes and anti-nodes in, in between and so on. So in solar atmosphere, since we know everywhere there is a magnetic field, depending on the magnetic field orientation and how the perturbations are, you will definitely generate Alvin waves. And when waves are there everywhere, they're very important player for solar wind acceleration. 
and uh, some of these in situ instruments, they will pro valvent beds as well. No, it's maybe the most difficult question. So. <laughs> Okay. Well, no, it is not working in the infrared. But basically, you know, the liquid mirror telescope is a reflecting, you know, it's a it's a collecting photons. Whether it is optical or infrared doesn't matter. It depends on the which camera you have. If you have a camera which is infrared sensitive, it will take infrared image. But right now we have only optical. We don't have infrared camera in the liquid mirror telescope right now. Having said that, we have infrared camera and uh, infrared uh, spectrograph in 3.6 meter there was still optical telescope that is there so uh, so essentially at a low cost at a much lower cost you have a very large photon collecting bucket i'll put it that way and that allows you to look at very faint objects also and since it is always looking at the uh, same portion of the sky there is a possibility of building signal by adding up many frames. Even like today, you see one object, that object will come back tomorrow or even another time of the even uh, after several months. And then you can add up these images and build a better signal to noise, which will allow you to probe much deeper in the universe as well. So it has multiple application in terms of uh, imaging capability. And, uh, you know, observing is uh, straightforward in the sense, once the mirror is there, it is always observing. Your camera needs to be uh, working. It's not, the mirror is not stopped at all. Depending on the weather condition, you'll open the dome and collect it. But the mirror is always, uh, always there. You cannot stop it. The moment you stop the, you know, circulation, liquid, uh, you know, uh, mercury will come to the, center of the thing where there is a sort of collection point and, and so on. It's a very interesting actually concept. Uh, and I'm just quite curious how the image uh, will be processed. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Sir, as we know that Calvary is an angular point, so there could be many angles involving around us at that point. Maybe a so, how do you make sure that the uh, uh, article would not be by any of those Good point. Actually, uh, what I understand is rather than L L1, you are right. The, any uh, Lagrangian point has a possibility of uh, collecting uh, a lot of debris also. But if you look at this, uh, you know, big, uh, you know, stuff, depending on the size of the particles and so on and so forth, their orbit will be different as well. We are not sitting there that all the particles are going to be there. Huh? So probably there will be a sort of patch around this, but we are much heavier. We are one ton. Okay. And uh, we do have some fuel as well. So it is not that, uh, you know, we will not be able to correct our trajectories and so on. So um, what I understand the, uh, probably the, uh, uh, you know, the smaller particles, fragmentations and all that will be much closer. The orbital things are, are there. It's not evenly distributed. I was told that L5 is much more uh, uh, difficult and it has uh, much more uh, of accumulation of these, uh, you know, debris. So what happens is every mission will carry different payloads. Uh, we don't, uh, you know, uh, build the same payload and go again in the space because we have already gathered that knowledge. So uh, going to Lagrangian one point uh, is a, a very classical vantage point for looking at the sun continuously. And anything comes from the sun before it reaches Earth has to pass through this. So it has an ideal location for doing space weather 
you know, studies as well and probing the solar wind and, and, and so on. So one can even say, or rephrase your question, there is a big ESA mission set, uh, called SOHO, Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, which was launched in 95, gone to L1, still functioning, still functioning. So why are we going there? L1, I mean, the SOHO has 13 instruments, but none of the instruments are the same as what they have. So when you have a new eye, you look at the sun with a new vision uh, and with a better advanced technology and all that, we are able to have much more sophisticated cameras and you know capabilities. We have onboard intelligence, I did not talk about it. We are trying to detect these ejectors on board because you know we will not be able to download all that data uh, and process it uh, you know, uh, at the ground station. So we are planning to have uh, you know, some intelligence on board while observing so that when such ejecta happens, we have many, many frames. Otherwise, you know, as I mentioned that, you know, these days cameras can take, you know, from your uh, mobile cameras and your camera will be filled in no time uh, because it's a large volume of data. I mean, the camera, what we have, it has 50 frames per second. So, uh, but we cannot afford that kind of data accumulation in space. So that means, you know, in, in space, we have to have some intelligence to select. It's like motion sensor uh, CCTV cameras. Motion sensor CCTV cameras do not record all the images. They only record the images where the camera sees a movement with the same principle. Like, you know, a guy moves out, so it works as a different images, right? You compare this image with the next image and find that there is some, uh, you know, pixels, which is different then you capture this too. Otherwise they don't record. So that kind of, uh, you know, intelligence are being incorporated in new missions and so on. So any new mission will look for new instrumentation, new ways of uh, capturing the data and processing the data as well. So uh, you give us another mission, we will give you another 10 new instruments. We are always ready with new instruments. Mm -hmm. Science ka koi end nahi hota hai. Yeah. So uh, as you see here, the mercury is uh, just as a reflected surface we are using. And on the top of that, there is a mylar sheet which is uh, sort of allow, uh, allowing not the mercury to get uh, in touch with the air. Yeah, so that contamination issue is sort of addressed. No individuals go into this room. As I said, this, is, this person has got inside uh, to pour the you know, mercury and all that. Only for very critical operations, individuals go inside. Nobody is allowed to go inside this room. Hmm? It's, comparatively clean environment. On the top of that, the mirror is completely covered with the mylar sheet and all that. So contamination is, uh, and mercury being, I do not know that that kind of uh, uh, contamination problems are not there. Uh, and we are looking at optical. So again, if you look at, you know, UV and all that, those contamination issues are much more stringent there. Um, Huh, what was your other part of the question? My question was how do you account for the contamination of signal, uh, not physically, but by the transmission of the spectrum? No, it is just uh, acting as a, you know, we are not looking at a spectrum or anything. We are just imaging the object. So uh, some just optical uh, light falls and it gets bounced to the, the, so this is the primary uh, reflecting surface. And in secondary we have, we don't have a spectrograph or anything. So if there is a, but I do not know why you are so worried about the, uh, the transitions and all that. In general also in a spectrograph, uh, of course the spectrograph environment has to be again, kept it into vacuum and so on and so on so that there is no uh, other uh, you know, elements there. But uh, in this particular case, we don't have to worry about it uh, that much now. I mean, since you asked the question, there is a small little worry about the temperature because uh, mercury does, uh, you know, have a, a coefficient of expansion, which is a temperature dependent, and that may change our uh, focus. And there are some um, models which is inbuilt now to correct for that as well.
Okay. Uh, I do not know whether there is any question online. Uh, yeah, somebody can raise a hand uh, if there is a question. Not many are there, but anyway, probably not. So, all yours. So, what are impactful questions? It has been such an honor to visit him. I would like to send you my heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Dipankar and Dr. Abhijit Kravatsu, all the professors, teachers, scholars, and the civil community of IDB. So, as you know, all of this, all, and you see the bond of this one on your feet. So, you just take a second and uh, as the photons of light hit the retina of your eye, remember that those are the testimony of the admission of our son for many of you. We are just a minuscule uh, as compared to the cosmic resistance. So uh, enjoy all the phenomena that are around you. So I think at this point we should conclude. Uh, as we move out of the gate, don't forget to keep the reception. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I will just probably leave the session and yeah.